Hello there, and welcome to the Audio Epics podcast for the premiere of the eighth episode of The Treasure of Boneyard Bay, with again four chapters for you to enjoy The Spikes, The Torches, The Bats, and The Tree. Fans of Indiana Jones or National Treasure will be having a blast with this episode, as our characters really dig in the treasure hunt here. Thank you so much for your likes, comments, and shares, and for reviewing and purchasing our stories in whichever way you prefer. After this episode, there will be four more. You will have noticed from last episode that we started showing another map. Instead of the world map, you could see the map of Garadoso. If you want to have it, there's a link in the pinned comment to download it for free. I created it myself using other world mapper. It's obviously a very simple map and nowhere near as good as the ones you can get from Silver Compass Maps, of course. We recently discovered Silver Compass Maps on Instagram, and it's a one-stop shop for everything RPG-related that you should really check out if you're a games master or dungeon master. Silver Compass Maps creates maps for tabletop role-playing games like D&D and Pathfinder, and they could be battle maps, world maps or settlement maps, in different variants like daytime and nighttime version of the same location, and it's just incredibly well done. We really like the style. Silver Compass uses a lot of lighting and shadow and makes the maps very atmospheric and come alive. We also met up with a fellow fantasy writer online that I discovered I have a lot in common with, so I wanted to give him a shout out here on YouTube. His name is Mike Soldano, and he's written a fantasy series in seven parts called Tales from the Wasteland. You can find him on social media as the Writing Mage 82 We haven't been able to read any of his books yet, but we're definitely interested in checking them out. There's a lot of talented people out there who can use the support, so we'll mention them here on YouTube if we make any new interesting discoveries. You can find the contact data below in the description. Visit our Patreon page if you want to support us to create more stories at a faster pace. It will help us pay for software, legal sound effects and music, and so on. That is patreon.com slash audioepics. Tiers start from $1 on, and many include merchandise. From the Witch Hunter Master tier on, that's the $10 tier, you can even get the full download of the extended edition of this story. That is the 50 minutes longer version than this standard edition on YouTube and Podbean. Don't forget to subscribe and get notified of new content. Ring that bell and always stay up to date. Now I won't have you wait any longer or someone else might be running off with that treasure. Enjoy the eighth episode of The Treasure of Boneyard Bay. The Spikes Ludlove returned Chappelle's hat to her and heaved a sigh of relief. As she put it back on her head, he saw her silhouetted in the dying ruddy light, surrounded by the fading haze of dust, her long hair wild and untamed about her face and shoulders, her eyes mere glints in the gloom. And for a moment, she seemed like a heroine from the tales of old. Follow me, she said then turned and walked back into the black tunnel behind the secret door. They all did so, and soon found themselves in another narrow space of inky blackness. It was a lot cooler here, and there was a moist feeling in the air. When his eyes had adjusted to the darkness, Ludlov realized that it was not all black. From ahead came a very faint green-bluish hue, just enough to see the outline of the tunnel by. Watch out, there are steps here, Chappelle said. They all carefully ascended and entered into a new room. It became clear now where the glow had come from. Several in their company gasped at the sight. Alvarado's mouth fell open. It was a much larger room, square and tall, but constructed in very roughly hewn stones, making it almost look like a cave. All along the walls, 
were hundreds of wide-capped mushrooms, glowing with a bluish-green light, each cap's light undulating in its own rhythm, twinkling like the stars on a summer night. The moss that they found on the walls here and there seemed to glow as well, albeit with a fainter light. Together, the mushrooms and the moss were bright enough to illuminate the entire room. Truly, the wonders of creation are limitless, breathed Blessed Salenheim. They sure are. I don't know about the moss, but the mushrooms, that's Agaricum sublucium, Gustav said. Strange to find them here. I've only ever seen them in deep caves on the mainland. Be careful not to touch them. I assume they're not edible. Are they poisonous? Alvarado asked. Not at all, Gustav admitted. In fact, the mucus is even good for the skin, or so they say. But the glow fades when you touch them. They go dark. Good for the skin, Alvarado repeated. I think we can do with one less light in all of this, he said. And before anyone could stop him, he had already stroked his finger on one of the glowing caps nearby. It immediately went dark, as did the surrounding ones. The darkness rippled out along the wall, over to the other walls and all the way to the other side. I meant to warn you for that, Gustav said through gritted teeth. There was still a glow ahead, though. Their collective attention was now drawn towards the obstacle in front of them. The flagstone-covered floor continued for about four paces until it suddenly fell away. From that chasm came the remaining glow. It was at least fifteen paces long in Ludlow's estimation. Now that the walls had gone dark, he couldn't see the opposite side anymore, but when they had entered, he had seen a similar terrace of stone there, as well as an open doorway in the far wall. Most likely, that would be the only exit. Instinctively, Ludlov stepped forward and made his way to the edge of the chasm. About six meters below was a pool of water, full of brightly glowing algae. It provided even more light than the mushrooms, of a pure blue color. My Agora Sublucia, said Gustav, who had followed Ludlov to the edge. It used to grow in Urba Classica. Imagine the waterways of the city at night. Ludlov didn't pay attention. He was too focused on the forest of razor-sharp bone-white spikes that emerged from the pool, ending about two meters below their feet. They probably were made of some kind of bone, Ludlov thought, although he wondered what sort of creature could provide such massive straight spears, each as thick as Ludlov's own arms at the point where they emerged from the water. Swimming is not an option then, I suppose. As he had been watching the chasm, the light of the mushrooms had slowly begun to twinkle again all around them. He could now clearly see the doorway at the far end of this cavernous space. Turning around to look behind, Ludlov saw the doorway from which they had entered, which looked exactly the same as the one on the opposite side. Slightly above it, to the right, there was a gaping hole in the wall. That's where I came from, Chappelle explained. Beside the doorway lay a neatly stacked pile of white stakes. They looked like the spikes in the chasm, but much smaller, perhaps as long as Ludlov's forearms. On the left wall, next to them, there was a huge metal disc embedded in the wall. Upon closer inspection, it consisted of an inner and an outer ring, surrounding a disc with an angry bearded face embossed upon it. Each of the rings had four holes in them, one above the center, one below, one to the left, and one to the right. Federhel frowned, as if this reminded him of something he couldn't immediately remember. I hear water dripping. Where is it coming from? Alvarado asked, making Federhel frown even more as he was breaking his head over those circles. All around us, Tomgard said. The walls are as damp as a cave. In fact, I'd say we're practically in a cave. No, it's more. Uh, something more uh, steady, Alvarado said, concentrating his hearing. Over there, 
von Baumeister said, pointing in the direction of the left wall above the basin, where there was a metal pipe sticking out. It was about as wide as a man's head and still within arm's reach. Occasionally, a few drops of clear water trickled out of it. Do you think it's drinkable? Alvarado asked. Gustav shrugged. Why don't you try it? But try not to touch any mushrooms this time. Chappelle investigated the walls from a distance. Perhaps we could uh, use that pipe to stand on and climb across the walls to the other side. She mused. Do you have a death wish? Tom God blurted out. If you climb those walls, they'll go dark. And those walls must be slippery. You'll tumble down and impale yourself onto those spikes before you know it. And besides, not all of us will be able to make that climb. Can you imagine the priestess up there? No offense, Blessed. None taken, Blessed Zelenheim said with a crooked smile. Rudlov was quietly relieved that Tormgard had dared to say what he himself was thinking, and also that he didn't have to endure the glare Chappelle was now aiming at her peer. I was just thinking out loud, she said finally. I knew it, cried out Federhelm, who had been investigating the disc more closely. Do you see those eight holes around the disc? That's a Nomaki lock. You will have to explain that to us, Initiate, said von Baumeister. I don't think any of us know what that is. Understandably, Master, Federhel admitted. It is a bit obscure, but the topic won't spark my interest. He looked at the circles in the wall admiringly before turning to his audience again. Well, the ancient Mesopotamians have always fascinated me. How did they build a thriving civilization over such a wide territory? Especially with all the sea travel between Garadoso and Esclavia. Get to the point, Tomgard said. Well, one of the customs of the Mesopotamians was to build massive cisterns to protect their water supplies, and they locked them with these combination locks, which they called Nomaki locks for some reason. I know why that is. Gustav spoke up. It comes from Virgasia. The Nomaki are a tribe of nomads. The Mesopotamians must have taken the whole idea from these desert dwellers. That would make sense, if Virgasia is indeed a real place, Fedahel said, sounding a bit skeptic. Do you know how it works? That's all that matters now, von Baumeister pressed. Yes, Fedahel said enthusiastically. We've got to insert spikes into the holes, but we've got to do it in the right order. And then what happens? The master asked. Then the cistern behind this wall will be emptied into this basin here, Federhel said, gesturing with his chin to the chasm beside him. And when it's full, we can swim across, Ludlov said, as he realized what Federhel's plan was. If it's some kind of combination look, do you know the correct combination? Asked Blessed Zelenheim. Of course, Federhel said. As you can see, there are two rings, a smaller one inside a bigger one. Each ring has one hole above, one below, one left and one right of the center. We've got to start from the outer ring, inserting a spike above the center, then one above the center on the inner ring, right below it, followed by one below the center on the inner circle, then one just below that on the outer circle, and then left and then right on the outer circle, followed by the same routine on the inner circle. After all of that, you turn the inner circle clockwise and the outer circle counterclockwise simultaneously. And then the water will come out. You know that by heart? You're a madman, Alvarado said with a shocked expression. But I'm glad you are our madman. Federhel basked in the compliment, which Ludlov knew it had been. What happens if we don't get the order right? asked Tormgard. Then the water would seep out of the cistern via the wrong duct further down in the wall and it would be lost, Federhel said, nervously biting his lower lip. Maybe they'd rather have died of thirst themselves than have their enemies steal their water. I suppose it matches the queer logic of those people. But still, it's always fascinated me. Well, we'll never know if we don't try it, Alvarado said optimistically. I'm sure the spikes we need are the ones over there by the doorway, Federhel said. Chappelle had already moved over to the doorway to pick them up. 
I will seek them in, she said. I thought you would suggest that, Chapel, but I think not, von Baumeister said. We need someone tall, with long arms. I think Initiate Ludlov will do. Yes, I think we all know we need a man for that sort of business, Alvarado said. Chapel grumpily ignored his remark and handed Ludlov the eight spikes. Ludlov took a deep breath. He wasn't looking forward to this, especially now that he knew what was at stake. Very well, he said reluctantly, and moved over to the two circles. He took one spike and handed the others over to Alvarado, who was standing nearby. Inserting the first one proved to be rather difficult. The hole was quite high, and Ludlov had to stand on his toes and stretch out his arm as far as he could. When he inserted the spike, he tried to push it in as deep as he could, to make sure he had done it right. Then it felt like he had pierced something, like a piece of leather with a needle, and he heard a faint click. Ludlov hoped this was a good sign, and looked self-consciously at the others, who held their breaths and gestured him to go on. He proceeded to insert the other spikes in the order Federhel had indicated. When it was time to insert the one in the hole on the far right, which was almost straight above the culvert, he ran into trouble. My arm doesn't reach that far, he said. You'll have to support your boot on the culvert then, answered von Baumeister. Isn't that too slippery? Chappelle said, still sounding a bit peeved. I'll have to hold on to one of you. Ludlov said, hoping his boot wouldn't slip on the metal pipe. When his foot touched the metal, he pushed himself up onto the wall, grabbing Chappelle's shoulder for support as she held on to his hand. Though her grip was firm, her hand felt surprisingly small and cold. While trying to find his balance, he accidentally kicked one of the mushrooms. The darkness rippled out across them, leaving him hanging with only the ghostly glare from the algae in the water below him. The wall was slippery indeed. Ludlov knew that if he fell into the basin, it would be a miracle if he were to avoid the sharp spikes. Even if he did, it would be a steep drop. It might end their entire endeavor for everyone. Trying not to think about that, he inserted the spike into the hole on the far right. As he tried to make his way back to the others, he almost slipped again. But Chappelle didn't let go and Alvarado grabbed his arm and pulled him back. Now, Ludlov could insert the spike to the left of the culvert, which was much easier. To enter the one on the right, he had to climb onto the wall again, extending the darkness as he even managed to fully scrape off a mushroom with his boot. The fungus plummeted down into the water. Sorry about that. He inserted the spike and, feeling more confident this time, jumped back on his own from the culvert. I'll need some help with the turning, he said. Alvarado immediately came to his aid. Ludlov tugged at one of the spikes on the inner circle. He felt some resistance, but to his surprise, all four of them eventually moved in synchronicity. He proceeded to turn the inner circle while Alvarado turned the outer one. When both were fully turned, there was a sound like a huge key being turned in a massive lock behind the wall. Then, there were other things moving and stirring behind the stern. Some ancient mechanism was at work. All of a sudden, without warning, a great mass of water burst out of the pipe like a geyser. It was like a waterfall, powerful and thunderous. They all looked on as the light of the mushrooms slowly returned, and the basin began to fill up. Vader Hell, you are a genius! Alvarado cried above the roar of the water. Ludlov was just happy he had survived the ordeal, and enjoyed the feel of the fresh cold mist and droplets of this artificial waterfall on his face. Someone patted him on the back. He turned surprised to see it was Tormgar. Well done, Nishet, he said, without a hint of irony in his voice. Ludlov nodded, grateful for the rare but genuine compliment. Despite the enormous force of the water, it still took a very long time for the basin to fill up. They sat down on the stone floor and ate their rations. Ludlov didn't know what time it was outside, 
only that he was hungry and grateful for the chance to eat. When they were done, they just sat there, watching as the bony spikes were slowly being submerged. Eventually, after what felt like half a day, the strength of the water flow began to diminish, until it turned into a small stream, then little more than a trickle, before finally drying up altogether. The water reached to the very edge of the basin, even slightly spilling over onto the floor where they stood. It was quiet again. Now we swim, von Baumeister said. Are you sure there's no other way? Tomgard said in a small voice, inviting a cocked eyebrow from his master. Of course not, von Baumeister said. But uh, our boots, our gear, how can we swim with them? Won't they weigh us down too much? I can get them across, Gustav said excitedly. Don't tell me you have a boat tucked into your backpack somewhere, Gustav. Alvarado said. Not in my backpack, no, but I saw a coracle in the room with the dragon, made from a sea turtle shell, I think. Good work, Fatlander, said von Baumeister. Go and get it then. Without another word, Gustav left. All of you, take off your hats, your boots, your weapons, your belts, anything that would wear you down, the master commanded. Everyone obeyed including Ludlov, who felt uncertain about removing his weaponry, although he understood the need. Then Gustav returned with the coracle. It was large enough to store a good deal of material, but he would still have to go back a second time. Perhaps someone should cross in the coracle in order to um, guard the weapons and such, Tumgard stammered. Wait, Tumgard? Are you afraid of the water? Chappelle said, trying to hide her smile. No, I'm not. I'm just wary of what's in it, Tomgard said. The algae or the spikes? Chappelle asked. Yes, Tomgard said, causing her to shrug. Be a witch hunter, Tomgard, von Baumeister said, his voice dripping with disgust. You will swim across like the rest of us. Mr. Finsterdunkel will be pushing the coracle. All right then, master, Tomgard said, eyeing the water as if it might suddenly jump out at him. Once the coracle was filled with their gear, Gustav pushed it into the water. Then they entered the pool themselves, very carefully, aware of the razor-sharp spikes not far below them. The water was ice cold, and Ludlow found himself gasping for breath as his chest seemed to constrict. Federhel and Chappelle had almost the same reaction. Von Baumeister only grunted stoically. Alvarado screamed as if he had been bit by a scorpion, and Gustav just called the water lovely and refreshing. Turmgard was still standing on the stone floor next to the priestess. He was trying to look stoic, but he was clearly having a dreadful time. They didn't waste any more time and began to swim. When they were a few paces ahead, Chappelle turned around and held still. What is it? She called out. I can't swim, came the priestess's voice from behind Ludlov, who also turned. Neither can I, said Tomgard. Very well, I will carry you, blessed said Chappelle. Ludlov, you take Turmgard. Ludlov swam back and allowed Turmgard to grab hold of his shoulders. The swim across was a lot more arduous with the additional weight, and Ludlov found his foot brushing against the tip of one of the spikes at one point. Still, they managed to make their way to the other side without any real trouble, albeit with a lot of effort. Emerging out of the water, Ludlov was more exhausted than he had been after the dive in Kulmaron's crown. He lay down on the stone, panting. How is it that a witch hunter can't swim? He asked Tomgard. It's not a requirement, Tomgard said defensively. I can still hunt witches on land. Plenty more to be found there than in the sea, don't you think? <laughs> Ludlov couldn't help but laugh and sat up, resting his elbow on his knees. He saw how Alvarado helped the priestess out of the water. 
Chappelle climbed out on her own. Well, said Gustave, who had just unloaded the coracle, I'll go back and fetch the other things now. Ludlow took a look at the first load and noticed it only consisted of Gustave's own backpack and some boots. All the other things were still on the other side. He found his own pair among the footwear and was pulling them on as he saw Gustave arrive in the distance. The Flatlander proceeded to fill the coracle again with the remaining gear. It was piled on precariously high. Rapiers stuck out on the side and witch hunter hats lay piled on top of each other in the middle. There was even a belt partly dangling in the water. Gustav shoved the coracle into the basin, letting it float on its own for a bit before getting in himself. He began to swim calmly, now and then pushing the coracle along. Ludlow had his boots on by this point, but lacking for anything else to do, he sat and watched the coracle float towards them. Gustav was halfway when he suddenly cried out in pain and grasped the coracle on the side, causing it to wobble. Ludlow veered upright when he saw his pistol tumble down from the pile into the water. Gustav! He cried out, but it was too late. He couldn't expect the Flatlander to go look for it between that forest of razor-sharp spikes. I'm all right, don't worry, Gustav called out. Just a cramp. Probably shouldn't have eaten so soon before swimming. My pistol! Ludlow cried out in horror. Oh, that? Gustav said. Sorry about that. I'll buy you a new one when we get home. The Torches Passing through the door on the opposite side, they once again found themselves in a gloomy, damp corridor. At the end of the dark passageway was another set of steps. We're moving up. That's a good sign, Gustav said. Ever the optimist, Alvarado commented with a smile. They emerged in a very tall space. Here, too, the walls were aglow with hundreds of mushrooms. But these were bulbous in form, and they glowed with a sickly green-yellow glare very distinct from the fungi that had illuminated the last room. Looking around, Ludlow realized this place looked more like a natural cave than the last one. The walls were slanted inward. They were rough and wet, and there were even small stalactites in some places, dripping water into little puddles. Instead of tiles or flagstones, they now treaded on damp gravel and dirt. There were several little mounds, mostly near the corners, where clusters of the strange new mushrooms were huddled together. Apart from the natural elements, the room was very sparse. In the middle stood a low altar, which amounted to nothing more than a massive granite slab, with some simple decorative carvings on the sides. Next to it was a stone pedestal, with a dome-shaped metal lid resting on it. In the low, strangely colored light, the entire place looked grim, ghostly, and decidedly unpleasant. As they entered, Ludlow also noticed the smell. It was pervasive and pungent, but he couldn't identify it. Wordlessly, they all spread out, each investigating a different part of the room. There are more carvings on the walls here, but I can't make them out. These mushrooms don't provide enough light, Federhel said. Don't touch any mushrooms. There's little enough to see as it is, von Baumeister warned. There are niches in the walls, Alvarado said. Tall and narrow ones, with sconces bearing only torches inside. Perhaps we should find some way to light them. Tomgard reached the pedestal and lifted the lid. There are some small stones here, he said. Those are flint stones, Gustav clarified. Joining Tomgard, he took a closer look at them. Yes, as I thought, a scorton blue flame rock. Those are very effective. Even in a damp place like this, you can expect them to still light a spark after hundreds of years. Here, let me show you. Wait! Federhel called out. 
That smell. Don't you notice it? Notice it? Gustav said, already holding a flintstone in each hand. I can barely stand it. It's some sort of oil or gas. Something that doesn't like fire, Federhal said. Or likes it a little too much, Tomgard muttered. There's something else here, Blessed Zelenheim said, who was standing not too far from Tomgard and Gustav. It looks like... well, a bit like a stone umbrella stand. But there are unlit torches in it. Gustav joined her, bent down and sniffed the torches. Ah, yes. This is where the smell comes from. And I know what it is. Enlighten us, please, von Baumeister said with grim sarcasm. It's gypsy oil. I sell it in my shop. What on earth is gypsy oil? Ludlov asked. Gustav shrugged. The gypsies make it. How or from what, I don't know. But it burns very, very well and it never loses its capacity. We have us caught in Flintstones, Federhel said, and gypsy burning oil. This was put here by the Sintra. It must be part of the trials to find the treasure. And clearly, we meant to set something on fire, Chappelle said. But what? Oh, I know what these are, Alvarado said suddenly. He sounded a bit queasy. He was looking at the walls, ignoring the conversation that had been going on. What do you mean? Tomgard asked apprehensively. These aren't mushrooms, Alvarado said. Then he turned towards them. He looked almost as bad as he had done after his encounter with the green brusher. These are eggs. What sort of eggs precisely? asked von Baumeister. I don't know what they are called, but they are the largest and nastiest insects I have ever seen. I encountered them once, in a long abandoned wine cellar. They have stingers as big as my finger. What did you do? Chappelle asked. I ran. I closed the door, never opened it again. Frowning, von Baumeister commented, Well, I hope that's not what you'll be doing if we encounter them here, Initiate. That would look very bad on your evaluation. I was ten years old then, Master, Alvarado clarified, but von Baumeister ignored him. That sounds a lot like pixel letters, Gustav said. Come to think of it, you must be right, Alvarado. Spixolettles do have glowing eggs, and they do live in caves. And they're native to Garadoso. Although you can find them in Esclavia as well, but very rarely. I sincerely hope you're making all of this up, Ludlov said. Of course not, Gustav said indignantly. Spixolettles are huge and extremely aggressive. They are quite poisonous, but their stingers are so big and powerful they might just kill you the old-fashioned way. The old-fashioned way? What do you mean? Alvarado asked tensely. You know, stabbing you to death, Gustav clarified with a shrug. Most insects don't like fire, Chappelle said. I think we should light at least one of these torches, just for a start. If there is some sort of puzzle we have to solve, we will need light to see by. It sounded very reasonable to Ludlov. Von Baumeister simply nodded his approval and Chappelle took one of the torches out of the stand, holding it out to Gustav, who was pleased to be able to demonstrate how well the Oskorten Blue Flame Rock worked. With a single strike, he had already produced a spark big enough to light the tip of the torch. The warmth and clarity of the light was quite refreshing in this dank, dark, squalid place. Impressive, Chappelle said, before walking over to Federhelm. There seem to be single words carved into the walls around each of those niches with sconces in them, the initiate said. But there's only one full sentence, right here in the middle of the room. Chappelle held the torch aloft so they could at last see what was written on the wall. Like the words on the door of the temple, they were in Orba Classican lettering, but the language was foreign to Ludlow. Is it Oskorten again? He asked Federhel, who nodded. Roughly translated, it says, Know your enemy as yourself, 
but don't show your enemy's strength, the young man said. Chappelle frowned. That first part seems like sound advice, but the second doesn't make much sense to me. I have to admit, I agree, Federhel said. Perhaps we should look at it from Sintrasha's point of view, Ludlov suggested. I assume she put this text here, or her followers did. Chappelle gave him an appraising look. What do you mean? Well, whom does the text address? Who would be the sort of person Sintrasha wanted to find the treasure? A Sintra, I'm sure, Alvarado said. But that's not what we are. No, we aren't, Ludlov said. But let's imagine for a moment that you are a Sintra, Alvarado, and you are standing here, reading those words. Who would be the enemy? The Ungra, Alvarado said, understanding dawning on his face. The Sintra and the Ungra have always been at each other's throats. In that case, the text should be read as, don't show the Ungra's strength, Chappelle said. What is the Ungra's strength exactly? Necromancy, Tomgard said bitterly. I think we should look at the other words first, Federhel suggested. Chappelle slowly walked around the room, revealing all of the words on the wall. As he looked on, Ludlov was surprised to see quite a few words he knew on there. Mens, Caput, Manus, Visus. These are just common lingua words. Then it dawned on him. Of course, it makes perfect sense. We've been thinking in terms of Sintra versus Ungra, but I think Sintrasha had a different vision. She went back to Garadoso to hide the treasure. The original home of all the Scortons, Federhel said, and their enemy was Oba Classica, Plinius Novacula in particular. So what was his strength? Alvarado asked. Necromancy again, Tomgard said. There are a lot of Ascorton words as well, Federhel concluded, as Chappelle finished her tour around the room. I'd say they're about evenly divided between Ascorton and Lingua. Mind, head, hand, sight. I don't know Ascorton, but from what I've seen of the Lingua words, they all convey some aspect of a person, either mental or physical. Ludlov said. Which one would be the enemy's strength? So it must be one of the words on the wall, the enemy's strength. Chappelle said. Vis or Rubur, perhaps? She read the words aloud. And then we have to uh, not show that word. She mumbled. Then she fell silent. I have no idea what that might mean, Federhel said. I was thinking something. Blessed Zeilenheim said quietly. They all looked at her. Federhel translated the text as don't show your enemy's strength. But it could also be translated as don't reveal or even don't illuminate. Aha! And there are torches in those niches beneath the words, Alvarado said. That must mean we should not light the torch beneath a word in lingua that stands for the strength of Orba Classica or Plinius Novacula. So do we light all the others then? Tomgard asked. Ludlov wasn't sure whether he was being sarcastic again or not, but Alvarado simply smiled and nodded in response. Everyone looked to von Paumeister for confirmation. You have my blessing, he said, but there remains one problem. Where is the word we need? Everyone was quiet again, lost in thought. Chappelle slowly revisited each of the niches and held her torch high to illuminate the words above them. What does Odes mean in Oskurten? She asked Federhel. It means rock or stone, he said. I guess the enemy's strength would not be throwing rocks. Rocks or stones aren't aspects of a person, Ludlov said. That doesn't feel right. At least, I assume this is an O. Chappelle said, reading the word again. It's half covered by some of those glowing eggs. After what Alvarado told us, I don't intend to touch any of them. Oh no, indeed. I wouldn't remove those eggs. 
Alvarado said. You don't want anything to come out of it. Hmm, said Ludlow. It does appear like there might be another letter in front of it. Part of the S is covered as well. Allow me, said Gustav. I have experience with this sort of thing. He approached with his pocket knife in hand. He had to stand on the tip of his toes and extend his arms as far as he could to reach the eggs, but he began to scrape them off. There we are, Gustav grunted, as he removed the eggs on both sides of the word. As he stepped aside and carefully put them back down on the ground, Ludlov smiled. There it was, the full word potestas. Power in lingua, he said. Oh, yes. In fact, the Oscorton word for strength could also mean power, Federhel said. Don't illuminate the power of your enemy, Chappelle retranslated the sentence excitedly. It was not a trait, just a word in itself. Well, let's light all the other torches then except this one, concluded Federhel. Everyone, take a torch and start lighting. Von Baumeister commanded, jerking his chin in the direction of the stand with the torches. It surprised Ludlow the master was so willing to follow Federhell's advice. Most likely he was just getting tired of the endless riddles and darkness, and simply wanted to move on as quickly as possible. Ludlow took a torch and handed one to Alvarado as well. There were enough torches for everyone, leaving some to spare. Ludlow lit his torch by holding it to Chappelle's then passed on the flame to Alvarado's and made his way to the wall. He lit the torches in the sconces underneath the words Oculus, Ater, which was a scorton for face, according to Federhel, and Visus. Each time, the cavernous room became a little bit brighter and more agreeable. And each time, the smoke rose up and disappeared into a shaft inside the wall above the sconce. When he came to the fourth sconce, however, the smoke remained hanging in the room and spread outward. He bent down to look up into the shaft, wondering if something was blocking it. There was a black mass in there. He carefully tried to move it to the side with the tip of his rapier, causing the smoke to rise up in the shaft as it should. But when he removed his weapon, he heard an unfamiliar screech and the fluttering of wings. He darted back just in time before a monstrous creature emerged out of the shaft, buzzing into the room. It was as large as a cat, crescent-shaped and armored with a pitch-black carapace. It had six long, gangly limbs that ended in sharp hooks. Its triangular head was equipped with slimy mandibles, and at the end of its body was a long, thin stinger, aimed straight forward. Its wings were only visible as a hazy shadow behind its body, moving too quickly for the human eye. Smoke billowed out as the creature fled from the fire and fluttered around the room. To Ludlow's horror, several more of the creatures had ended now. Stop moving! There's pixelettles! Gustav shouted. They can't see you if you don't move! Praying to the goddess that the Flatlander wasn't just mouthing off again, Ludlow obeyed and held still. The others did the same, except for Chappelle, who had drawn her rapier and began to slash at the creatures while waving her torch with her other one. Chappelle, don't! Gustav warned, but either she couldn't hear him or she ignored him because she kept slashing at the vicious things. She even drew one of her daggers, which she used sparingly, but Ludlow had never seen her miss. She threw it, sending it spinning through the air until it pierced one of the nasty creatures through its thorax. It zigzagged through the air, fleeing to the other side of the cave. Tomgard was there to jab his torch into the creature, burning it to death. Meanwhile, Chappelle stood alone against another opponent. Ludlow couldn't just let her handle this threat on her own and sprang back into action. He saw how Chappelle slashed the wings of the next creature, causing it to plummet down onto the ground, where it lay squirming and crawling furiously. Alvarado, the third to draw his rapier, sliced its head clean off, after which it stopped moving. The giant insects were tremendously fast. Ludlow could only swing his blade and torch at them, hoping he'd accidentally burn one or slice one of their limbs or wings off. Then, 
there was the grinding sound of heavy stone. Ludlov looked in its direction and saw that part of the wall was opening, revealing a new corridor. Quick! Go through! Von Baumeister shouted, and those who stood nearby obeyed. But Ludlov saw that Chappelle and Alvarado were still fighting off the insects. Standing some distance apart, they were each slashing with their blades and waving their torches, chasing off their adversaries. But the vicious creatures always returned. Ludlov saw that everyone else had already left through the doorway, which was slowly beginning to slide down again. He decided not to worry about the closing door and went to aid Chappelle first. Right before Ludlov could reach her, another creature unexpectedly appeared right in front of his face. He was only just quick enough to duck out of the way of its sting. As the bug raced past him, he turned and threw his torch at it. The Spixoletto produced a terrible screech as it caught fire and crashed. Ludlov turned back to Chappelle, but it was too late. He was just in time to witness the horrific moment when the attacking creature's stinger buried itself into the flesh right beneath her shoulder. Screaming in pain and fury, she grabbed the monster and pulled it away from her, but it kept fluttering its wings angrily. Ludlov instinctively reached out and grabbed the insect by the wings, flinging it away from him. The bug danced drunkenly through the air for a few moments before Alvarado finished it off with a single slash of his rapier, spilling yellow blood. There was a brief moment of relief when all the creatures were dead. But then, Chappelle collapsed on the ground. Ludlov knelt down and grabbed her. Quick, Ludlov! Alvarado shouted. Looking over his shoulder, Ludlov saw that the door was already halfway closed. Tomgard and Gustav were both trying to push it back up, but it didn't help. Ludlov hoisted the unconscious Chappelle onto his shoulder and hastened to the doorway as fast as he could. Alvarado, who was already a bit closer, still turned back to help him carry her. You can't help! Run! Ludlov shouted breathlessly. His dark eyes large and full of pain and doubt, Alvarado nodded and dashed towards the door. He had to crawl on his hands and knees to get through. Ludlov knew it was impossible for both himself and Chappelle to make it through in time. He crouched and laid her down. As Alvarado dragged her by her feet into the next room, the door kept lowering remorselessly. Ludlov was sure he would be shut out, until Tromgard put an unlit torch in place, holding an opening just wide enough for Ludlov to crawl through on his belly. Certain this solution wouldn't hold forever, he didn't hesitate for a second. He had to slither like a snake, dragging the side of his face through the gravel. When he finally fully emerged on the other side, he accidentally kicked the torch, causing it to break. The door fell shut with a massive thud. Ludlov sat back against the wall, gasping for the air of this new room. They were in a straight corridor, just wide enough for three men to stand abreast, slanted upwards. The only light now came from the torches held by von Baumeister, the priestess and Gustav. There was no more trace of glowing eggs or mushrooms. The walls were bare and dry, and the floor was hard and even. Ludlov hardly noticed the environment, though. Once recovered from the exertion, his attention was fully focused on Chapelle, who lay motionless on her back, surrounded by the other treasure hunters. Alvarado held his ear close to her face. She is breathing, he said, but softly, very softly. Then he put his head to her chest, and her heart is beating, but too fast and irregular. He sat upright and looked at Ludlov, a bit helpless. I know what to do, Ludlov said. He opened Chappelle's leather jerkin and pulled aside her shirt underneath, just far enough to show the wound. The puncture itself was small, but the surrounding skin was swollen and discolored. I'll have to suck up the venom, he said. Are you sure? Tuomgard asked, wincing. He's right, Gustav said. That's how you deal with poisonous bites. Alvarado gestured invitingly to Ludlov, who was surprised his Esclavian friend hadn't offered to put his own lips to Chappelle's skin. You're going to be all right. Ludlov told Chappelle, putting his lips to the wound and sucking as hard as he could. 
he tasted something exceedingly bitter that dominated the subtle tang of blood. Then he lost all feeling in his tongue. He spat out the vile substance as quickly as he could and regretted having to inspect it. The yellow spit had a pinkish tone in it, so he knew he had managed to get all of the venom out. Someone took his shoulder. He turned to see it was Gustav, holding a canteen. Here, wash it away, he said. Ludlow did so and spat the water and whatever might have remained from the venom onto the floor. Meanwhile, Chappelle was still lying unconscious. Maybe it's time I repay her favor, Alvarado said. And without further hesitation, he put his lips to hers and blew into her mouth the way she had done after his encounter with the green brusher. To Alvarado's credit, he went about it in a focused and practical manner. Ludlow could tell he truly was worried. Alvarado stopped for a moment and looked at the others. No one had any alternative suggestions. So he bowed down once more, only to be shoved in the chest by Chappelle's hand. That will do, Initiate, she said in a clear voice. <laughs> Alvarado <laughs> laughed, tears glistening in his dark eyes. The Bats There were more sconces with unlit torches on the walls. Gustav had taken some of the blue flame rock with him from the last room and proceeded to light some of the torches with it. Ludlow was tired of dangling at the tail and decided to join Gustav at the head of the group, carrying a torch himself. Alvarado and Chappelle were right behind him. Are you sure you can walk? The Esclavian initiate asked. I'm absolutely fine, Chappelle responded. My shoulder and arm still hurt on the side where I was stung, but other than that, nothing. Thank you for your efforts to revive me, but clearly it wasn't necessary. I was fine. You were unconscious, Chappelle, Tomgard said from behind her. And you didn't look fine at all. You were dying until only Ludlow was brave enough to suck that foul poison out of you. Without him, you'd be dead. A bit embarrassed by the utterly unexpected praise, Ludlow tried to stay out of the picture, but Chappelle addressed him. Is that true, Ludlow? He turned and shrugged. It's... <clears throat> it's what you do in such a situation, he said. Few would have had the guts to allow that poison anywhere near their mouths, seeing what it was doing to her, Gustav interjected. I mean, I would have, of course, but you got there first. Chappelle regarded Ludlow with large, earnest eyes, gleaming in the torchlight. I thank you, Initiate. I will commend you. Ludlow felt his heart swell, but he responded only with a smile and a nod. Then he turned again and joined Gustav in the march onward and upward. Soon, the slanted floor became flat again, but the upward journey continued on a new staircase. After a minute or two, they were near the top. There was an open doorway ahead, behind which they couldn't see anything yet. In front of it, something else drew their attention. There was a strange white crust that had accumulated on top of the steps, almost like dry, hard snow. Ludlow and Gustav both held still, causing the group behind them to do the same. What do you think that is? Ludlow asked, aware of the Flatlander's unusual knowledge of all things foul in this world. Gustav kneeled and broke off a lump of the crust, then crushed it between his thumb and forefinger. Hardwing bats, he said. Their droppings are used to make paint, among other things. Then he sighed and looked up at Ludlow. <sighs> there must be many of them in the room ahead. Do those things sting or bite? Blessed Zelenheim asked. Ludlow could barely see her, standing on the steps below, 
partly hidden behind Chapelle, Alvarado and Tomgard. She looked haggard, tired and terrified, and he suddenly felt very sorry for her. No, 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 they're not bugs, Gustav said, but I still wouldn't want to disturb a whole nest of them. I hear they fly into your hair and get tangled there, Tomgard said. I thought that was a myth, Alvarado said in a small voice, running his hand protectively over his head. Despite everything they had faced, his hair still looked remarkably well-maintained, Ludla thought, especially compared to the two women. Move on, bats or no, von Baumeister ordered curtly. Ludlov and Gustav nodded in unison and took the final steps towards the doorway. As soon as they went through, there was an outburst of shrieks and yelps and a hurricane of black leather wings fluttered over and around them. Ludlov ducked and heard Alvarado and the priestess scream behind him. When the worst of it was over, he stood up and looked behind him. Some of the bats disappeared down the stairwell, but a few clasped the ceiling above them and hung there, scuttling about for a bit and flexing their wings. Actually, they are rather cute, Alvarado said suddenly. Chapelle <laughs> laughed. They are, she admitted as she watched the furry creatures frolic about. Their oversized ears did make them look endearingly clumsy, Ludlow quietly agreed. Then he noticed something far more interesting. There was natural light ahead. The Tree Ludlov found himself in a dark antechamber. The way ahead was blocked by a mass of roots and creeping vines, but soft light shone through between them. Gustav, do you still have that machete? he asked. Of course, the Flatlander reacted enthusiastically. He took off his backpack and began searching for the item. When he had found it, he handed it to Ludlov, who proceeded to hack at the plants until he had made an opening big enough to step through if he ducked. He emerged into a place of glorious peace. It was the highest level of the temple, right beneath the head. He remembered from his first view that the south wall was mostly broken, allowing natural light and weather to enter. The view outside was framed by the silhouettes of vines and roots. Apparently, it was dusk. One half of the sky was fading from a deep blue to a warm purple. But Ludlov could also see broiling storm clouds gathering, slowly but surely moving to overtake the peaceful evening sky. Suddenly, Ludlov realized that somewhere above him had to be the colossal stone head of Kulmaron. Most of the room was taken up by a clear, still pond. It was full of the same luminous algae they had encountered before. He could see the water was quite shallow and wouldn't even reach to his knees if he were to wade through it. In the middle of the pond was perhaps the most beautiful tree he had ever seen. Its trunk was thick, its bark smooth and its branches reached across the entire ceiling. Its leaves were lush and green, but it also bore hundreds of flowers, each the size of Ludlov's hand, glowing with the same soft light as the algae in the water, filling the entire room with a soothing, poetic scent. In the north wall was a shadowy opening, perhaps the beginning of another tunnel, all along the walls of the room grew thousands of purple bell-shaped flowers. As Ludlov was taking in the scene, Gustav appeared beside him. He gasped at the sight of the natural beauty. This is why I go on adventures, he said. Well, this and the treasure. I wish I could take this view home with me. Ludlov said. Take a good look, and you'll have a memory to take with you, Gustav replied with a shrug. Then he turned back to the opening through which they had entered. 
It looked like they had come out of a small overgrown cave in a corner of the vast room. Come along! It's safe here! A little while later, the others emerged one by one. Everyone had the same look of awe on their faces. Even Master von Baumeister raised an eyebrow in appreciation. They all kept carrying their torches, unsure of how long they would be able to make use of the natural light outside. Truly, nothing we can make matches the work of the goddess, said Blessed Zelenheim. Well said, Blessed, replied Alvarado. Men did not make these flowers, nor that tree. It must be truly ancient, from before Sintrasha's time, Ludlov remarked. Gustav nodded. It's a wizard's mantle. You can find them almost anywhere in the northern continent, but always in a remote location, and always alone. They even grow below ground, Federhel added. There were several in the underground gardens of Oskorta. What are those purple flowers? Chappelle asked. I don't know them. Nepliana, Gustav said. You know plants and flowers quite well, Federhel remarked. Gustav shrugged. You pick up some things as you travel the world, he said. Are they edible? Alvarado asked. No, you gluttonous esclavian, not everything is for eating, Gustav said. In fact, these might take a bite out of you. They're flesh-eating plants. Do they really bite people? Asked the priestess. No, not really, Gustav admitted. At least I don't think so. They only eat insects, lizards, mice, that sort of thing. They're lovely looking flowers though, aren't they? In truth, they're actually quite nasty. They have this corrosive sap inside. When they digest their prey, they make a horrible gurgling noise that will ruin your appetite. Ugh, that reminds me of a lady I used to, um, court, Alvarado commented. She was beautiful, but as soon as she opened her mouth, her voice ruined the whole picture. Still, she was amazing in b uh, uh, board games. She was good at board games. No one is interested in the sordid details of your former fornication initiate, von Baumeister said. The question is, how do we proceed from here? Ludlov noticed Alvarado smiling sheepishly towards the priestess. It was a long time ago. I have long since amended my ways, he heard him say. I think we should take a look at that tree, Federhel said. It must be here for a reason. Ludlov's own attention was drawn towards the dark opening in the north wall, and he made his way towards it. It was not a tunnel, but more akin to an antechamber, leading towards a metal door. In the middle of the door hung a strange lump of something that might have been clay, but it had a nastier look to it. It was crusty and brownish in color. It could even have been the beginnings of some insect nest that had never been completed, Ludlov mused. There was no key or handle anywhere, so it seemed impossible to open the door. Above it was a plaque with drawings engraved in it. On a stone pedestal beside the door was a large bowl with some objects inside. Ludlov emerged back into the main room and called out to the others. There's a door here. Come, take a look. Federhel was the first to join him, exploring the place with his torch. The firelight immediately revealed what the items in the bowl were, a brush and a spile. What does the plaque above the door say? Ludlov asked. As Federhel raised his torch, the images on the plaque became clearer in the flickering light. There was a tree on the left, two drops in the middle, drawn so that the lines partly overlapped, and then a flower to the right. It's a riddle, Federhel said. Ludlov agreed. We need to do something involving a tree, two drops and a flower, he said. Chappelle joined them in the antechamber. Aha, we need to take sap from the tree and from a flower to open that door, she said. You have a quick mind, Federhel said admiringly. In any case, your interpretation makes sense, Ludlov said, 
since there is a bowl here where these saps might be mixed, but what would be the purpose of the spile in the brush? Federhel picked up the spile. This is a tree tapping spile, he said. You can stick it in the tree's bark and sap will flow out. Well, that answers that question, Chappelle said. But what about the flower? The carving seems to represent Gustav's flesh-eating... Uh, what was it? Nepoyana! Gustav completed for her as he approached. I once met a beautiful Vrosnikivan lady named after this flower, so its name is planted in my memory. <laughs> Just like with that lady, you have to be careful with it. Its sap is very corrosive. It might even destroy your blade. The plant might also spill its contents in your direction if you don't cut open the stem of the flower the right way. That paralyzes it. Don't you have some disposable knife in your backpack somewhere? Ludlov asked. As a matter of fact, I do have several knives, Gustav said. But I still don't want to lose any one of them. Perhaps out of an automatic urge to feel useful, with Vedahel and Gustav being the brains and tools of the operation, Ludlov picked up the brush from the bowl to take it along. Chappelle followed his example, taking the bowl and the spile. From Baumeister, Turmgard, Zelenheim and Alvarado were spread out over the area, investigating the details of the environment. The sky was darkening beyond them, but the luminescent algae in the pond, the tree flowers and the torches still provided enough light to see everything clearly. We know what we need to do, Chapelle announced, turning the heads of the others. There is a door in the wall that can only be opened using a mixture of saps from the wizard's mantle tree and the Nipliana flowers. Good work, witch hunter, von Baumeister said. Get to it then. Gustav rummaged around in his backpack and took out a pair of leather gloves. Never touch a Nepliana with your bare hands, he said. Then, eventually, he took out a small pocket knife. This will do, he said, and began walking around the room. What are you looking for? There are plenty of flowers, just pick one, Tomgard said. I want to find one that's a bit apart from the others, Gustav explained. Otherwise, I might get attacked. Attacked? Really? They're plants? Tomgard said. Flesh-eating plants, Alvarado corrected. Why don't you tap the tree already? Chappelle suggested to Tormgard, shoving the bowl and the spile into his hands. You just need some brute force to stick that spile into the bark. That seems like something for you. Aye, I can do that, no problem. Tormgard grumbled. Ludlov watched the witch hunter as he hacked the spile into the bark in the space above two large roots. Tormgard was attacking the tree as if it were a vampire, and the spile was his wooden stake. He quickly placed the bowl underneath, and shortly after, the thick sap came flowing steadily, but slowly out of the spile into the bowl, like lava from a volcano. The remarkable light in the room even gave the almond brown sap an orange glow. How much do we need? Turngard asked. Chappelle only shrugged. Fill it halfway, said von Baumeister. The other half will be the sap from the flower. Turmgard sighed, staring at the slow stream of sap. Ludlov wandered around, once again taking in the splendor of this place, while absent-mindedly brushing his hand. The brush felt hard and firm. He inspected its tip. It looked like it was made of thick, bristly hair unlike any he'd ever seen. Meanwhile, Gustav had found a lonely Nepliana flower, growing a bit apart from the others. He knelt down beside it, holding his knife in one hand. The flower turned towards him curiously. Gustav quickly grasped its base in his fist. The plant actually began to squirm, trying to break free. It moved like an animal. Then Gustav took his pocket knife and slashed the stem of the flower as if it were the throat of a sheep. The Nepliana stopped moving and gurgled like some horrid creature bleeding to its death as a thick drop of sap came out of the stem. We don't have the bowl yet, Federhel said in a slightly panicky voice. No need yet, 
said Gustav. This was just to disarm the flour. I'm pretty sure it's the digestive sap we need from the calyx, as it's thinner. Federhel brightened up. Of course, he said. The thin digestive sap will make the thick sap from the bark of the tree fit for applying it to a surface. They waited for Tomgard to bring the half-filled bowl, and then Gustav, still wearing the gloves, slowly but steadily poured the contents of the calyx on top of it. It was bright green and indeed much more liquid than the thick tree sap. The drops that splattered onto the side of the bowl immediately burned small holes into it, but where it mingled with the wizard's mantle sap, it quickly turned into some rather harmless-looking green ooze. Mingle it some more, Rudolf suggested. With what? Tormgard asked. My granny's soup ladle? Ludlov handed him the brush, feeling relieved he could contribute to the endeavor again. Good, said the Flatlander, accepting it. He stirred the admixture in the well-stocked bowl quickly but carefully, until it became a monochromatic sludge. When he pulled the brush out again, Ludlov expected it to be badly corroded, but to his surprise, it looked fine. So what do we do with this goo? von Baumeister asked. We should be able to open the door with it. Ludlov said, although I wonder how exactly. That crusty lump, Federhel said, as if it were a matter of course. We'll have to cart it. Gustav moved towards the door as quickly as he could without spilling the contents of the bowl. The others followed. Chapelle, we've seen on the Theresia that you're good with a brush, Gustav said once they were in the antechamber. Maybe you should... All right. She replied apprehensively. Although this isn't quite like painting flowers. Chapelle carefully took over the bowl and turned the brush in the green sludge. She couldn't help inspecting it as she pulled it out. Then she started to apply to the lump on the door. It immediately began to bubble and foam. Well, it seems to have an effect, Gustav said. Go on. Chapelle continued her work until it became clear that the entire lump was being eaten away by the admixture. Splash some water on it, von Baumeister commanded as the door was drenched in brownish-green foam. Gustav took off one boot and ran to the pool around the tree to fill it with water. He hopped on one foot on his way back and splashed the water over the door. As the foam washed away, a handle became clearly visible. It seemed to be made of jade. Gustav, still wearing gloves and still in one boot, immediately turned the handle and pushed. There was a crackling sound as the dust, grime and dirt that had accumulated over the ages was loosened and the door opened. Ludlow, Alvarado, von Baumeister and Blessed Zelenheim spread out and used their torches to shed some light on the place while Gustav was putting his boot back on. Chapelle and Tormgard followed Ludlov as he explored this new area. They were entering into the mountain behind the temple now, Ludlov realized. It was not a room, but a dusty cave, smaller than the previous one, but still large enough for about 30 to 50 people to stand. There was no daylight, but there were sconces with unlit torches on the walls, which Ludlov and the others began to light. Slowly, the warm glow of fire spread throughout the cave, and the environment became clearly visible. In the middle were five life-sized statues, carved in the style of the ancient Matpatanians, arranged like the dots of a five on a die. In front were two warriors with round shields and broad swords like scimitars facing each other, their blades clashing in the middle. Their necks were long and sinuous, ending in snake-like heads that hissed angrily at each other. The Iskar, Fidel said. I always thought they were just a legend, but perhaps they really did exist. What are they? Tormgard asked. Well, rumor has it that the ancient Matpatanians used magic to create these snake men who served as their foot soldiers. These might just be mythical depictions, though. 
the escar mainly feature in early Mesopotamian literature. If they ever existed, they would have died out by the end of their civilization. Behind the warriors, in the middle of the arrangement, stood a robed figure. The face was utterly unreadable. It had no mouth or nose, and only two round, dark holes where the eyes would be. On its head was an elaborate crest. The figure was pointing to the two guardians, its hand raised high. This must be some sort of high priest or official, Federhel observed. Ludlow found the hollow eyes rather disturbing. If this statue depicted a real person, it had to have been a mask of some sort. Behind the priestly figure were the final two figures in the arrangement. It was a man and a woman, similarly arrayed. The man was dressed only in a skirt and sandals, while the woman also wore a necklace of feathers that covered her chest. They were standing back to back, facing outward, their hands cupped at the waist. There was also a large plaque at the far end of the cave. Once more, it displayed Oscorten words in Urba classic and lettering. Federhel, can you translate? Von Baumeister asked as he beheld the plaque. I can, said Federhel, and I think it will clarify a lot. <clears throat> the three lines above read, Guardians opposed, lovers apart, the high one condemns. And then below that, it says, Guardians defend, lovers unite, the high one points the way. Clearly, this is about the statues, Ludlow said. The description seems to match the characters. Chappelle walked over to the statues and investigated them. The snake men must be the guardians. Clearly they are opposed since they seem to be fighting each other. And the lovers are apart because they aren't facing each other, Alvarado said. That means the robed man is the high one and he condemns the soldiers for fighting each other instead of defending the people. Ludlow said. It seems to me that the three top lines describe the current situation, Federhel said, which means the three lines below describe what the scene should look like. Guardians defend, Ludlow repeated from the translation. He thought about it for a bit, and then made his way to the two snake soldiers. He took hold of the left one and pulled. To his surprise, it was actually quite easy to swivel the statue. Clearly, it had been constructed with that purpose. One by one, Ludlow turned both soldiers so that they faced forward, their swords held ready against anyone who would dare to harm the robed figure or the couple. I see, Alvarado said, and he moved to the couple, turning both statues so that they faced each other. When he did so, the two characters looked into each other's eyes, and it seemed like they were reaching out to hold each other's hands as well. Lovers unite, he said. Then now the high one can show the way, Tomgard said, as he entered the scene and turned the priestly statue around. Not much happened until it pointed in a direction somewhere past the shoulders of the female statue, near the back of the cave there was a metallic clank somewhere beneath their feet, followed by the rumbling of stone as part of the wall slid down there, accompanied by a cloud of dust that slowly spread through the cave. As the dust settled and they all approached, the torchlight revealed a rectangular doorway and a winding staircase beyond it, leading up. The final stage begins, said Blessed Zelenheim. Thank you for listening to the eighth episode of The Treasure of Boneyard Bay, a witch hunter tale. These are some of our wonderful patrons, always eager to give us feedback, inspiration and motivation to keep us creating. Arno Teva Jalen Lewis Caitlin Bredenkamp, Kat Mosiri, Osarion, Ryan Stock, Cody Heitch, 
Kadir Hussein. Mix and Match. Cameron Brantley. Joseph Stowell. Liam Gabriel. Tony Ranico. Peter Strandkrone. Amy Austin. And Matt Patain. I hope I pronounced all of your names correctly. You might have noticed there are two new names on the list. October brought us four new patrons, for which we are very grateful. We currently have 22 patrons, and the ones mentioned here were the Witch Hunters or higher ranking patrons. We also want to thank our Captains of the Guard and Guardsmen for their ongoing support. We can't say it too many times how much your support means to us, not just financially, but you guys are the fuel of our writing spirit. If you want to join our Patreon community, make sure to check out patreon.com slash audioepics. If you don't need all the extra content and merchandise and just want to purchase the extended edition of the story that is 50 minutes longer, you can find the link to Bandcamp in the description or the pinned comment. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell or activate the RSS feed on Podbean. That was the notification bell and my cue that it's time to launch the trailer of Counterbalance. This is a high fantasy audio drama by Blighthouse Studio. Domin plays a minor character in episode 5, and to support each other we agree to swap trailers. Here it is. Hello, Aurel. Yeah. Did you want Don't to listen in on me and Rock enjoying ourselves? Don't encourage Should him. I describe to you what we're doing um, right now? Picasso, huh? what's going on? Let's see. Look, these wind shells document anything you do in order to banish the spirits. I don't banish spirits. I'm fixing the tango. Of course, we can't open a new hole into the Aetherweb every year. But spirits aren't always bad. Are Those they? are exactly the reason tango weeds happened in the first Akasar, place. I'm sure Rocka knows how to get through a water gate without disrupting the magic balance. So what happens when there's a hole in the weave? Does magic <laughs> pour out? It is already broken! Let more of air into this world! I'll destroy Wait, no, every single no. one of them! You've had enough already! I will kill you, you filthy Whoa, little... Whoa, 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 come down, Kaka! Try it, fellow jester! You die, ferocious rune master! Your friction will grind the weave a twain! <sighs> Yarta. In moments like these, I wish I could see the runes. What's wrong, Raka? Is that tangle weave maybe too difficult even for someone as great as you? Counterbalance. A high fantasy audio drama. Subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get podcasts from. So, this was the trailer to Counterbalance. Uh, you can find more information about the story on trelunus.com. And we'll provide all the details in the description below. The next chapter of The Treasure of Boneyard Bay is called The Head and will be premiered next week. After all these spikes, the stakes are finally getting higher. We hope to welcome you again. In the meantime, you can check out Counterbalance or speculate about Boneyard Bay with fellow fans on Discord in the Spoilers Allowed channel. Take care and we hope you'll return to one of our platforms for episode 9. <laughs>